Okay, so if you want somebody to do something uh, memorably awesome, like um, dreaming up uh, the structure of a benzene um, molecule or something like that, actually literally in a dream, some German uh, scientists did that, as is mentioned in Asimov's um, internal memo to the Manhattan Project. If you want to do that according to the um, to that essay, um, you have to allow people some uh, not to be slammed down constantly by criticism every time they say something um, idiotic or foolish. Um, because um, Asimov says usually the creative person knows that they're saying quite a few things that are foolish. The point is that they're um, making some laboratory moves, you know. So, um, I mean, in our time uh, right now, there's this, the American lawyers like to um, cite Justice Brandeis to um, speak of the quote-unquote laboratories of democracy. Um, allow a laboratory to have um, a wide um, breadth here of meaning. We don't know what it means. Part of the methodos would be that we don't, um, the methodos, the path, this is a term used by Aristotle and often translated as investigation. So part of our matter of investigating um, would be following some rules, some lot, um, like those laid down by Asimov, would, which would be not to um, kill the... Um, the baby before it's born simply because um, we notice it has some genetic disorders and we've um, decided that um, the main thing with um, abortion is that it be convenient for some theory about um, a life based on um, something like, I don't know, Harold Laswell's theory of um, happiness based on like... Um, economic base, um, uh, some kind of um, recognition, or he doesn't say recognition in this, that's topical in Hegelian um, discussion, but uh, if we want to be more intellectual, which is to say be more fashionable, we should find another term for that, um, should be something like... Um, Deference, I think. So the citizen seeks deference, according to um, Laswell, which is what made that uh, definition of his um, seem to be worthy of um, repeating to me. Um, but that's one thing. I mean, deference can mean anything from your legal reputation uh, to your um, pocketbook and so, a status in the broadest sense. But I think deference is a nice way of putting it. It's like people are deferring to you, um, this is something that every citizen would seek as part of happiness. And then you would say, oh, this, uh, this um, we know the fetus has Down syndrome, therefore they can't possibly, any deference they're going to get would be probably um, ironic in some way, or like um, it would only be out of pity, or it would be genuine in some cases, but it wouldn't be the real stuff. And therefore, maybe this isn't the best um, go in this video game or whatnot. So there's that kind of attitude. Um, that you have to already know the standard for what you're going to bring into birth, for what you're going to allow yourself to um, conceive the meaning of ahead of time. And I guess Asimov's essay, if you look at it, is sort of saying um, uh, the best thing is to have, instead of having people that have all the information, which is definitely beneficial, it's nonetheless, if su such a person were to uh, attack the uh, the moral sucker or the morale of the um, of the ones generating ideas. This would be um, make all the, that they would we would gain from their information. Um, uh, it, it wouldn't be worth it in the balance. Um, so I want to try to establish more of this thesis I'm trying to lay down. I don't think I can get through the whole thing of um, about Zizek. So I have a, the a thesis or um, my view, um, which is certainly, um, I suppose, um, a somewhat um, idiosyncratic view, but I have a strong uh, feeling about it, which one can um, measure against uh, Nietzsche gives uh, uh, somebody called Bartolt um, uh, Niebuhr. Um, 
this uh, some kind of Prussian um, diplomat and, and um, businessman who was sent a letter back to uh, Prussia in um, Nietzsche's day from the Vatican saying that he's sort of figured it out and it's like this um, the best uh, the, the geniuses the best um, spirits of our mind of our of, of our time uh, do not know this truth that um, the forms that they live by are uh, either arbitrary or they're brought into existence because somebody uh, through emotion has read a deeper um, they've excuse me they've read a deeper emotion into some uh, form of life so like um, I mean form taken in the broadest sense and uh, Adolf Luce as a form of architecture. Um, uh, the um, social contract, um, quote unquote, legal fiction is a form of um, governance to make the distinction between uh, Gestalt uh, shaft and Gemeinschaft is um, a form of analysis and so on. But you could read a deep um, emotion into it, which is to say you could take it as experientially true. Like, you know, people say, um, People get mad sometimes, and you tell them something they're saying is false, and it's in their experience. So there's, they're like, "This is my experience. I know it." This is sort of the old meaning of emotional um, belief that it's just a matter of experience rather than a matter of spiritus or intellectus, and it hasn't been brought to the higher court of, um, let's say, in the simple sense of um, the principle of contradiction, things like that, in Aristotle or as they well, you looked at the, this and this view, and then you see that you're, there's a contradiction in your view, so you go back to your original experiential, um, they call it uh, con-natural, being with na- with nature. It's, it's sort of like, in modern terms, we describe that as our sort of conditioned response views, the views that we have um, by need, is by, that we've been sort of, we have, without consciously bringing them into a discussion where we think of things like contradiction and we ask ourselves, is there something we do- I don't know which is making me believe this? If I knew other things, would I still believe this? This kind of thing. Um, so uh, maybe in this sense, I um, um, put a caveat on my own view and saying maybe I'm just, I see a, a great cogency in it, so... Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, one can also say, as with many other views, there's many ways to look at the world which are in some way beneficial, including maybe the um, mathematical, physical sciences views stemming from uh, Galileo and so on, the current views. Those might be good in one way, but are, do they exhaust the whole interpretation of the world or the whole our whole um, um, being in the world? Are there maybe even a thousand and one other uh, such ways to look at the world, such as um, an economic interpretation of things, such as maybe in Jung, a personality um, understanding of things, of, of the main uh, motor of human being and human happiness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to go on, I want to quote something from uh, the edition I have of the basic, it's Heidegger's Basic Concepts book, uh, translated by Aylesworth on page 33, um, it says that we use the term plug-in, Einschalten, to name the connection, comma, an expression from machine technology and machine utilization is like an automatic proof of the actuality that finds words here, uh, quote-unquote, workers and soldiers, quote-unquote, remain obviously conventional names that nevertheless can signify roughly in an outline, the humanity now rising upon the earth. If the peasant transforms himself into a worker in the provisions industry, then this is the same process by which a leading scholar becomes the managing director of a research institute. So Zizek is actually um, such a managing um, director of the Burbank Institute, and I believe he holds similar positions uh, in other um, universities, but it's um, in this sense we can imagine Zizek like a big plug, like um, stuck into an outlet in the wall. In uh, his takeover of um, what I'm saying, that Zizek is now taking over the Habermas position as sort of the um, the 
core um, thinker who enunciates the status quo, as it were, the most powerful enunciator of the most um, powerful ideas. So there's different ways to interpret that. So like um, you could say Habermas, so Zizek's death blow to um, Habermas reads like this. Habermas still spoke of the knock hole in revolutions, which were the uh, quote-unquote catch-up revolutions, meaning that there's only one line of development, like in the Enlightenment line, and the people that this is sort of still, uh, of course, Habermas is from the German sphere, but his views are basically the same views that you would get in a pure form at the Cold Normal uh, Superior, which was set up during the French Revolution, I believe, uh, but which still um, through the... Um, you know, because the professors um, create their own disciples, as Derrida said in the um, French university. So there's sort of a medieval feel to it, and you sense this when you talk to these people. So the, their view is basically um, true optimism, optimism in the true philosophic sense. So even if they don't have a full conscience, everyone that is a graduate of that institution doesn't have a full sense of it, but the, genuinely it's in the culture of it. So the idea being that improvement is is happening. We, of course, we have to work on it, put in the labor, the effort, but it's happening and it's things are improving. So um, they don't need some, as it were, vulgarian like Steven Pinker to sell this to them. They have it at a much deeper level. Of their, in their, it's in their flesh. So um, this view, then there's, this view would mean then that the catch-up revolutions, I mean, everybody's trying to catch up with the rich North Atlantic West and so on. So we already know these views, right? These views are being discredited as we speak at least over the last 10 years, the last 20 years and so on. Habermas is quite old. Uh, Zizek is quite old himself. Zizek is past 70. Um, but so when that dies, it means then one can say... Um, Possibly this also coincides with that there's no uh, one general opinion of mankind that can be easily um, conformed to, as in the old Catholic sense, which is to say um, there's so much um, awareness, whether one is studying things or not, of um, things in the, I guess, in the lowest, in the most vulgar sense, like that one man's, um, uh, you know, revolutionary is... um, another man's um, terrorist or whatnot. But there's so many ideas that are just in the air that are challenged so that it's very difficult, even if one really is by disposition this kind of um, person who doesn't want to do the know thyself in the sense of challenging their opinions, uh, sort of it's necessarily happens because of just the, there's so many... Um, pundits and there's so many ideas in there, even if uh, at the same time it's a tale of two cities, you know, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, it's the most censorious time, there's the most censorship, and there's the most um, variegated um, freedom of promulgation of ideas. It's it's both at once. So um, the thesis I'm making is that Jijic takeover amounts to this. It's like what he says that we were going over in the last uh, view, where the ideologies say, um, in the Fukuyama sense, if um, some form of liberalism, liberal democratic theory, however defined, with the social contract theory, uh, with the division between government and society, etc., if this is to come to power and really come to power, it would mean uh, the dropping out of awareness of any alternative, such as... Um, that the uh, American Constitution would be replaced with um, a Sharia law, or that um, the Catholic, or m- much more plausible, of course, that the, um, some more Catholics would get in. But of course, the Catholics, since Pope, Pope Francis, have been uh, following their own trajectory, which, uh, even though they're existentially afraid of the um, the liberals with their culture program, in the sense that. Uh, all Catholic views could be put down as bigotism or as, as bigotry, you know. Um, they're again, I mean, because no matter how much they make moves towards um, gay marriage and other such issues, for example, they nonetheless, in their um, doctrinally, they view um, this as, as not the optimal uh, state of a human, uh, 
human being may think that the optimal state would be the, um, the male and the female um, marriage. Uh, although they say don't make, uh, they constantly make further and further um, degrees all the way to the last degree, as it would seem, of um, uh, concessionary um, announcements such as we, we, we should not try to make um, uh, people that deviate from this norm miserable. In other words, we should only, they get more and more to where they're only saying, we should say that this isn't the best, uh, this isn't the optimal state, but in every other way we should allow it. Um, but in any case, that's just, I'm just giving, trying to give a um, concrete um, enunciation of what the alternatives are, such as they are, but they become more and more um, less credible, right? They become more and less cogent. So you could just make something up and say, um, and also there's these views in um, the television show, The Game of Thrones, amongst the um, Death Raki, or however they're called, or you can quote some video game or something, right? But th that would just seem like fantasy, right? But to the extent that these views are pushed aside by the core ideology, everything begins to look like, like fantasy against it. So this is part of the, what I'm saying is when, when Zizek's views become the uh, most powerful views, it doesn't mean that there are um, some uh, profound ideas like a deep well that we're staring down in or something like that. Uh, some of them may be very strong ideas. I do think he's um, um, one of the two uh, most powerful thinkers, but what most powerful means currently living. So the other one is Alexander Dugan. But um, what most powerful means there is ambiguous, and it's hard for us to see because we're so close to it. Um, Leo Strauss, uh, Martin Heidegger, um, especially Heidegger, you can say this is a great thinker. And you could see even um, Zizek, who doesn't really want anything to do with Heidegger, uh, admits that Heidegger is, quote unquote, the real stuff. And, and quite a few uh, people admit that even if uh, he's uh, on the wrong side of the people that are into um, uh, psychology and the experimental psychology and cognitive uh, science and um, analytic philosophy. But uh, on the side of people that are open to something against that, which, however, totally dominates anything that has to do with um, political um, possibilities. Um, you get most people will admit some power to Heidegger, Foucault, and so forth, I believe. Um, of course, you have this Jordan Peterson thing. So, okay, that's a, a difficulty. But um, I just wanted to... Um, sort of dip a toe into that um, pond of the idea that uh, Zizek's thinking is now the most dominant thinking. Um, I'll mention this as a, a partial proof that there's no other, so far as I know still, there's no other living thinker that has um, a journal, like the International Journal of Zizek Studies, I believe is like maybe 14 years old by now. Um, and there's no other living thinker that has um, that kind of support in the world um, a really high theory of people that are, um, I mean, not just uh, political pundits, not just people that mention um, uh, Marx and with some, you know, some idiotic uh, comments about, oh, uh, Marx was for the material comes first and the ideas come second and uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, some rehearsed um, Sucarion type of things. You know, like... Um, one of the big differences we should go into is uh, Sucarion is a term used by Plato, so that means it's usually uh, interpreted, let's say, it's interpreted to mean the shrunken soul. Uh, it's sometimes Latinized as uh, Psycharion. Psych um, I think it appears in the Mino, but probably in other texts. But the idea is, uh, Leo Strauss glosses this by saying, most of us, most of the time, are memory people. Um, to be a memory man or a memory person, a memory woman, is um, sort of to be at the political journalistic level where you're quoting all kinds of things that you haven't um, generally uh, conceived the meaning. You haven't truly conceived the meaning of it. You haven't really understood it. Um, so we try to get to the level 
where not only can we really understand these, uh, what we're talking about, but um, it doesn't quite mean the same thing as being able to state it clearly to um, to the ordinary citizen. But uh, to really understand something, maybe to have acquired a new language, which is a sort of, um, there's a threshold moment, uh, not to say a new, not to say a, a turn to the new, um, to belonging to the some other way of thinking in some other region. But um, Zizek and Dugan definitely are not uh, simply uh, memory men. So that's in this way I say they're both um, very powerful, not just powerful thinkers in the way I was just trying to say that they're comparable to Habermas in that sense, but they're also powerful from this other point of view that they really are thinking about things, whether they do that well or not, um, may have something to do with the times we live in. It's hard to judge these kind of things, but so far as we can judge on the basis of are they just sheer journalists repeating a bunch of slogans and phrases? Absolutely not. So at least that's something good. Then you have these media, you know, this is what I was trying to say before about somebody, some of these other guys like Sam Harris, they're sort of like, they're a mixed case. There's a little bit of free thinking. And maybe Jordan Peterson is, is um, a funny mixed case like that too. Um, so I end with the one uh, remark here, um, if I have time to do it. Uh, Peter Thiel has said that um, when he started investing in AI, um, that there was a view that there's open view, maybe it could come out okay. But now almost everyone in the uh, Silicon Valley that he's got his money invested in here is uh, sort of working really slow on it because they a lot of them have come over to the view that AI will just um, kill everyone on the face of the planet and it's going to be um, terrible. So um, in this sense, uh, we ourselves may have to be the AI. You know, we may ourselves may have to be the, the, the Enlightenment. Uh, I think Peter Thiel says something good here where he gives a good a, a encapsulation of it. Is is people like Sam Harris say uh, we are the best reasoners in the world. We're the most logical. But uh, all the time they're shaking in their boots saying, we need something to replace us because uh, we're horrible. We need this AI to come and save us. Uh, this has something to do with um, giving up um, the ability to uh, use reason and to think for the ability to have a long list of um, fallacies and uh, logical rules and uh, other uh, uh, forms of methods which aren't free and open uh, methodos, which don't, uh, which are limited by a criteria of uh, what can be criticized and regarded as foolish by somebody who has a lot of information on their hand, and therefore which don't fit in with that Asimov uh, essay. So let's bookend it uh, with that.